you may have been blessed enough to visit St. Peter's Square in Rome, and perhaps if you haven't been able to visit it, you are familiar with the picture of the scene. In the middle of St. Peter's Square is what I think is one of the most intriguing architectural features in the whole of the Vatican. That is, a great stone obelisk that rises from the centre of the square. It's a single block of marble that rises to over 40 metres in height and weighs over 330 tonnes. It's a pretty serious piece of stone. It was first carved and mounted in Egypt in the year 2500 BC, over four and a half thousand years ago. It was a monument to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. In the year 37 AD, only a few years after the Lord's death and resurrection, when St. Peter and St. Paul were busily setting about beginning the church and starting to proclaim the gospel, long after the Egyptian Empire had collapsed and when the Roman Empire was at its peak, the Emperor Caligula brought that obelisk from Egypt to Rome as a monument to his own authority. It was a bit of a, a statement to say that Rome and his authority were greater than any of the Egyptian pharaohs and their authority. Of course, as we know, centuries later, the Roman Empire itself collapsed. When the barbarians invaded Rome and the city became a war zone around the year 4500 AD, the obelisk fell and lay half buried for around about a thousand years near the current site of St. Peter's Basilica. When St. Peter's was being rebuilt in the 1500s, it took over a hundred years to, to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica, Pope Sixtus V decided to, stat, to, to erect the, the, the obelisk at the center of what would eventually become St. Peter's Square. The Benigni Colonnade was not built for another 20 or 30 years. But Pope Sixtus V decided to place this obelisk at, at the, the meeting point between the world and St. Peter's Basilica, right at the front door of the Basilica. He saw that this obelisk, which for millennia had stood as a witness to the earthly kings of Egypt and Rome, would now stand as a witness to the true King of Heaven, Jesus Christ. At the obelisk's peak, Pope Sixtus placed a bronze cross, and inside that cross he mounted a small fragment of the true cross, the cross of Christ, which had been recovered from Jerusalem. At the base of the obelisk, the Pope had two inscriptions cut as reminders of the supremacy of Christ's kingship. The first inscription faces out towards the world, back down the Via della Conciliazione towards the city of Rome. And in Latin, it reads, Ecce crux domini, fugite partes abes, vincit veo de tribunit, which in English is, Behold the cross of the Lord. Let his enemies flee. The lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. On the side of the obelisk that faces back towards St. Peter's Basilica, he placed another inscription. Christus vincit, Christus regnant, Christus imperat. Christ conquers, Christ rules, Christ reigns. Today we celebrate the feast of Christ's universal kingship. He is the ultimate authority before whom every earthly authority must and will eventually 
in the news. But Christ's kingship is not like any authority we know on this earth. Pope St. John Paul II explained, if assessed according to the criteria of this world, Jesus' kingship appears paradoxical. It looks a bit strange, a bit impure. Those are my words, not Pope's. We know that in this world, even in democracy, authority is exercised by force. Authority is imposed upon us, even by elected officials. And haven't we seen an example of that this year? Where the measures uh, to um, pr protect us from the coronavirus limit its spread have been forcibly imposed upon us in a police state. Even in the um, in the Old Testament, the people of Israel never had a king. Originally, God established the people of Israel without a king. They had, if you like, regents. They were called judges. They fulfilled all of the functions of government, but they were not the king. They had God as their king. But one day they decided they wanted to be like the rest of the world around them. And so they said to God, we want to be like the other nations. Give us a king. God said, you've got a king. Me. They said, no, no, no. <laughs> That's nice, but not really. <laughs> we want an earthly king. <laughs> and he relented. God gave them a king. They had Saul and David and Solomon. And the moment kingship was established in Israel was really the beginning of the end for the people of Israel. Death and division and infidelity followed. We know that Saul became jealous of David. David slept with Bathsheba and committed all sorts of other sins. Under Solomon's reign, the kingdom became divided. Our first reading gives us an insight into the nature of Christ's authority. And it is very different from the authority of our earthly rulers. The Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when some of his sheep have scattered abroad, so I will seek out my sheep. And I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. This is the sort of authority Christ wields. It is an authority that has us, his people, front and centre. He is king for us not for his own sake. As befits this paradoxical reign of Christ that is so different from earthly authority, Christ does not force himself on us as our king. We do not have to have him as our king if we don't want to. There is another kingdom and there is another king. And if we do not have Christ as our king, we implicitly or explicitly have Satan as our king. We are free to choose between the two kingdoms, but we are certainly citizens of one or the other. The great Anglican writer C.S. Lewis observes, there is no neutral ground in the universe Every square inch, every split second, is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. Even if we, we, we get so comfortable in this life because of our, of our relative wealth, we feel that so many of our actions don't explicitly relate to our God. You know, what is maybe a cup of tea matter? What is, you know, where we speak to each other casually, matter. Every single action 
refers us to one kingdom or the other. Each of our actions aligns us with a kingdom and with a king. And that is precisely the message that Christ gives in that parable in the gospel. Every action matters. Pope Pius XI was the Pope who established the Feast of Christ the King. He established it in 1925. It's one of the more recent feasts in the Church's calendar. And he established it precisely to emphasize the authority of Christ at a time when God was beginning to be sidelined from people's lives. We see that, that rise of secularism and individualism flowering fully today. And for Pius the XI explained how Christ can be our king. How are we to make him our king? How do we choose Christ as our king? He gives us three key ways. First, he says, Christ must reign in our minds, which should assent with perfect submission and firm belief to the revealed truths and doctrines of Christ. The first way that Christ reigns is through our belief in him, our acceptance of his truth, our acceptance of his law. We cannot pick and choose what we want to believe. To pick and choose is already to align ourselves with another kingdom and another king. Much of what Christ asks of us is not easy, but the choice is ours. Next, Pope Pius XI explains, Christ must reign in our wills, which should obey the laws and precepts of God. In other words, it is not enough that we believe in God, we must also put our belief into action. Christ must reign in the way we act. Thirdly, Christ must reign in our hearts, which should spurn natural desires and love God above all things and cleave to Him alone. The parallel here is a good citizen of Victoria, for example, might know the road rules, follow the road rules when they drive, but in their hearts resent those road rules because they really want to test out how fast their car can go and they just really want to check who's seen their posts on Instagram. We can know the law of God we can accept Christ as our King. We can live in a way that establishes the reign of Christ, but still resent his authority and not really love him. If Christ reigns in us, then we will believe his truth, we will put it into action, and we will love him, not resent him. When Christ is our King, we become living obelisks. We become like that great stone pillar at the centre of St. Peter's Basilica. Monuments to our King. Outside in our actions, in our dealings with other people, will be that inscription that faces out towards the city of Rome. Behold the cross of the Lord. Let his enemies flee. The lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And in our hearts, facing towards God in our soul, will be that inscription that faces towards St. Peter's Basilica. Christ conquers. Christ rules. Christ reigns. 